This is a man who's an elder at his church. This is a man who is passionate about prayer. This is a man who has a family that he cares dearly about. And if you get to spend any time with him at all, you'll find a man of this intellect and a man of these accomplishments to be one of the most humble, Christ-like people you know. And I could give him no greater compliment than that. I give you Dr. Simon Gavikol. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, very generous introduction. I feel like I can only disappoint you now after, <laughs> after that. The, I don't know what it's like over here, but in the Sunday newspapers, what usually covers the front page of the Sunday newspaper is the latest misdemeanor of some football player or something like that. So back in 2006, I was very surprised to see on the front page of one of our leading Sunday newspapers the following headline. World exclusive. The gospel of Judas Iscariot. Greatest archaeological discovery of all time. Threat to 2,000 years of Christian teaching. Now, the claim of these lost gospels to be a threat to Christian teaching is, of course, made most famously by the Da Vinci Code. But it's not just in trashy newspapers and trashy novels that you find this sort of talk. Uh, the Oxford scientist, Richard Dawkins, makes the same sort of claim in his book, the God Delusion. The four Gospels that made it into the official canon were chosen more or less arbitrarily out of a larger sample of at least a dozen, including the Gospels of Peter, Thomas, Peter, Nicodemus, Philip, Bartholomew, and Mary Magdalene. You'll notice, of course, that Mary Magdalene is spelt wrong. It's spelt in the Oxford spelling. Uh, <laughs> and you often find statements of, like this made by uh, biblical scholars even as well, like Bart Ehrman and Elaine Pagels, uh, both of whom have appeared on the New York Times bestsellers list for their uh, books. I was going to say novels, but I, I should say <laughs> scholarly books. Um, now, I'm sure many people will have come across this view before, that there are lots of Gospels sloshing around in early Christianity, and it was only a matter of political intrigue which ones made it into the Bible and which ones were left out. I remember I went with Peter Williams, who you may have heard in a previous lecture, here to see the Da Vinci Code film when it first came out in 2006. And his favorite scene was the one uh, of the Council of Nicaea, where you see bishops on either side of the, uh, the great chamber in Nicaea, uh, arguing tooth and nail, sort of fighting uh, with each other about which books should get into the canon and which shouldn't. Now, since no scholar to my knowledge thinks that the Bible canon was even discussed at the Council of Nicaea, it's hard to know where to start with that one. But what are the differences between the Gospels in the New Testament and the other non-canonical or apocryphal Gospels? Are there any differences at all? Or was it just a matter of political power which determined the difference, whether or not it was made by Constantine at the Council of Nicaea? So first of all, we need to get clear in our minds about what is distinctive about the New Testament Gospels, the four Gospels in the New Testament, and then we're going to look at four case studies of these other Gospels. First of all, we know roughly when the New Testament Gospels were written. It's generally thought that Mark's Gospel came first and that John's Gospel was written last in around AD 90, with the other Gospels coming in between Matthew and Luke, uh, coming in between Mark in around 60 and John in around AD 90. That's something that a majority of scholars agree on, both about the order of the Gospels, composition, and in terms of the time frame in which they were written. The last of the Gospels in the New Testament, then, was written about 60 years after the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, that's roughly the same distance, chronologically, that we are from the Second World War. And I'll go, I'm going to be coming back to that point later on. But for now, uh, the main point to remember is that the Gospels in the New Testament were written roughly between AD 60 and AD 90. So what are they about? Well, of course, the New Testament Gospels are about Jesus. And the first point that they really stress about him is that he comes as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And uh, you can see this in Mark's Gospel, where you only need to get two verses into Mark's Gospel to see citation of Scripture. Uh, with this uh, statement, it's written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, to who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So immediately you're confronted with Scripture and John the Baptist as the fulfillment of Scripture, 
but even more so as Christ, the one whom Scripture pointing forward to John the Baptist, pointing forward to Jesus, is being talked about here, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew's Gospel has a similar concentration on Jesus as fulfillment of Scripture. And you see this particularly in the first two chapters of Matthew, where in those two chapters, those first two chapters, you have no less than five statements of Jesus coming as the fulfillment of prophecy, whether it's the statement that he is God with us, Emmanuel, in the prophecy Isaiah, or about how Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the city of David, as was talked about by uh, Hosea, or how about his birth is just as in a previous pattern in Scripture, is accompanied by a tragic slaughter of children. And so it goes on. Matthew continually offers a kind of running commentary through his gospel where he talks about the events of Jesus' ministry and then states, this took place in order to fulfill what was said by the prophet Isaiah or Jeremiah or whoever it is. This is particularly concentrated, though, at the beginning of Matthew's gospel. Now, Luke does things slightly differently. Luke's gospel does mention this fulfillment of prophecy all the way through his gospel, but there's a particular concentration on this theme at the very end, where uh, Luke talks about Jesus' death and resurrection as having taken place according to the divine plan. So uh, Jesus, uh, after his resurrection, begins with Moses and all the prophets, and he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So this was no historical accident what has taken place in the ministry of Jesus. It's all been planned. And it's not just particular little passages that you might find read out in carol concerts. Uh, For unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given, and all those passages that often come out at Christmas, at least in the UK. No, Luke emphasizes the fact that it's all of Scripture that is fulfilled, all the prophets in all the Scriptures, and as Jesus himself says, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms all point to him. So in different ways, whether it's uh, the commandments pointing out the need for salvation through our inability to fulfill them, or whether it's the sacrificial system in the Old Testament being fulfilled by Jesus' sacrificial death, or whether it's the royal uh, monarchy of David and David's rule being brought to perfection in Jesus' uh, kingship. The whole Old Testament pattern, the whole pattern of Old Testament history, looks forward to Jesus and speaks about him. So what is it about Jesus that the Old Testament says most about him Well, look at what Jesus goes on to say in this passage in Luke's Gospel. He told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So this leads us on from our first point about how Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy, straight to our second point. So secondly, he died for our sins and rose from the dead, so that we could be saved. Look at what Luke uh, says here. Jesus died and rose again, and as a result of this, forgiveness of sins is available for people the world over if they repent. So the second point is then that the main focus of of, uh, the Gospels is Jesus' death and resurrection, and especially how his death brings salvation and forgiveness from God. Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God, but he doesn't just announce that it is coming. He himself is the one who brings it in through his own activity and enables people to enter into it. Look at what uh, Mark's gospel, the earliest gospel, as I mentioned, says here. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, with Matthew recording uh, the same saying in almost identical wording. The expectation that some, even many Jews, uh, had at the time was that the Messiah would storm into Jerusalem, establish uh, conquest over the uh, foreign powers, and bring victory to Israel against her hated oppressors. Then God's reign would be visible uh, to everyone, and the Son of Man, prophesied in Daniel, would set up his everlasting kingdom. Now, Jesus doesn't quite do that. Before the Son of Man sets up his everlasting kingdom... It's first of all God's plan for this Son of Man to give his life. 
Now, this is perhaps a shock, as it was to many of his audiences. But the problem, the reason for this, was the problem of a debt. The problem that God's people had got themselves into a terrible debt which they could not repay. I don't know if you've read uh, Charles Dickens' novel, Little Dorrit. Well, for the first uh, half of the 860 pages of uh, Little Dorrit in the Penguin edition, uh, Mr. William Dorrit lies languishing in Marshall C. Debtor's prison in London. But the hero of the novel, Arthur Clennam, has made a wonderful discovery that far from being a debtor, uh, uh, Mr. Dorrit is actually the heir to a great fortune. And so in chapter 35, uh, halfway through the book, Arthur Clennam visits the prison and asks Mr. Dorrit, Mr. Dorrit, what would you like most? What is your greatest wish? And Mr. Dorrit, who can barely speak for weakness, points to the wall, implying that he wants to be the other side of the wall of that prison. And Mr. Clennam, uh, rejoicing, announces to Mr. Dorrit that the wall is gone. It is down. Mr. Dorrit let, then uh, leaves the prison, not only out of debt, but a rich man. And similarly, the central message of the New Testament Gospels is that the debt of sin, which people could never repay, has been cancelled. Someone has come to cancel that debt, to pay the ransom, and to make us free. The Son of Man came to give his life, to pay, uh, to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the saying of Jesus that Matthew and Mark include as a summary uh, of his mission. God, in his compassion, has sent this ransom. Now, John is often thought of as telling the story of Jesus from a quite different angle, as indeed he does. Uh, and it's interesting that in John's Gospel, the clearest statement of the effects of Jesus' death is stated by one of Jesus' opponents, the high priest Caiaphas. Caiaphas spells out how Jesus died as the substitute to save others. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So Jesus dies uh, for the people, bearing sin in their place as a substitute. Now, the substitution is not a particularly uh, difficult concept to understand. When I was uh, speaking about this recently, I tried to explain the point that substitution is an idea so simple that uh, even a football fan can understand what a substitute is. And <laughs> that works both in British football and in American football, I think. <laughs> So the heart of the gospel, uh, not just in the gospels, but in Paul's, Paul's letters and the rest of the New Testament, uh, focuses on the fact that Jesus died so to save his people and so that having risen from the dead, people can know him personally. So the two key facts about the gospels then, Jesus' fulfillment of the Old Testament by his coming and the purpose of that coming, the fact that he came to die to save people from their sins. So how do the other Gospels outside of the New Testament compare with that? Well, we're going to look at four of the most notorious examples uh, of these Gospels and then make some comparisons. And I don't think that uh, people in, in churches, for example, have anything particularly to kind of fear about in the contents of these Gospels. And sometimes people say to me that if, if they'd known what was in these Gospels, then they would know that people in the church really didn't have anything to be particularly scared of. The first case of these others that I'm going to look at is the Gospel of Thomas. Here's one Greek little fragment of it. Uh, we don't have the whole thing in the original language, but uh, this is one, of the, one part of one of the three uh, Greek fragments. This Gospel is one of the earliest uh, Gospels outside of the New Testament. It probably comes from around AD 140, and uh, wasn't really written uh, by the Apostle Thomas, no scholar thinks that, but it does come from a writer who wanted to maintain an allegiance to Jesus, but uh, with a quite unorthodox uh, spin on who Jesus was. Unlike the four Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas is not a story, uh, and it's not to be confused, by the way, with the infancy Gospel of Thomas, as it's sometimes called, with the stories of Jesus' childhood. This is the uh, Gospel of Thomas, which is a, a, a kind of database of 114 sayings about Jesus, according to which uh, Jesus di discloses the knowledge of secret revelation. 
This is how it begins. These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus, Judas, Thomas wrote down. And he said, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. So saying one is striking here. It's not through the death of Jesus, not through the cross that people are saved, but it's by finding the true interpretation of these deep mysteries that Jesus is revealing. Having said that, there's a surprising amount uh, in the Gospel of Thomas which overlaps with the New Testament Gospels, which Thomas borrows from the New Testament Gospels. And uh, there are a couple of snippets here which might look familiar, uh, though you might also notice some unfamiliar things about them as well. So the parable of the uh, fish net. The man is, I'll just uh, rattle through this fairly quickly. The man is like a wise fisherman who cast his net into the sea and drew it up from the sea full of small fish. Among them, the wise fisherman found a fine large fish. He threw all the small fish back into the sea and chose the large fish without difficulty. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Or there's the parable of the sower in the Gospel of Thomas as well, where Jesus said, Now the sower went out, took a handful of seeds and scattered them. Some fell on the road and uh, some, and birds came and gathered them up. Others fell on the rock, did not take root in the soil and so on. So some similar material to what we find in the four New Testament Gospels. But the way in which the Gospels, uh, the Gospel of Thomas differs from the New Testament Gospels is just as striking. Unlike them, Thomas has, like some Greek philosophers, the idea that people's individual souls have always existed since the beginning of time. So he says, Jesus said, blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. There's a lot of these, this kind of esoteric uh, sounding material in the Gospel of Thomas. Blessed is the person whose soul existed before time, uh, before he uh, came into being in the flesh. Now the soul comes from the paradise of the kingdom. And if that soul finds the secret interpretation of Jesus' sayings, then it will be able to get back to that kingdom. But in the meantime, it's trapped in the world, which the Gospel of Thomas likens to a dead body. The soul then is trapped in this world. Jesus said, whoever has come to understand the world has found only a corpse. And whoever has found a corpse is superior to the world. So the material world is basically a rotten, festering corpse. And that includes the human body, which is part of this material creation. Since that's what the world is like then, the goal for the soul is to escape from this world and return to the primordial light of God, the kingdom where the soul came from in the first place. So uh, saying 49, Jesus said, Blessed are the solitary and elect, for you will find the kingdom, for you are from it, and to it you will return. All of this comes with a heavy dosage of criticism of rival religious groups, whether Christian or Jewish. So, for example, uh, the Old Testament scriptures are described as having come from dead prophets. His disciples said to him, 24 prophets spoke in Israel and all of them spoke in you. But he, Jesus, said to them, you have omitted the one living in your presence and have spoken only of the dead. And finally, the Gospel of Thomas ends with a bit of a wild card in the last saying. Simon Peter said to him, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, uh, for those of you women out here, I, I wonder whether you prefer Simon Peter's view according to which you're excluded altogether, or whether you prefer Jesus' view where you can enter the kingdom, but you have to become a man in order to do so. One one just last thing that is perhaps surprising in the Gospel of Thomas, uh, Jesus seems to be quoting from Paul's letters, which I take it that is pretty unlikely for him to have done in his (laughs) earthly ministry. So first of all, something that looks very much like a quotation of 1 Corinthians. Jesus said, I shall give you what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no hands has touched and what has never occurred to the human mind. And here, uh, a discussion of circumcision. Again, it seems very anachronistic, seems very unlikely that Jesus would have condemned uh, circumcision in his ministry. So these points make it very unlikely, I think, that the Gospel of Thomas goes back to some uh, 
very early period, really before the New Testament, and gives us some uh, secret access to the real Jesus behind the Bible. So that's the Gospel of Thomas, one of the first of these new Gospels to have been written in the second century, a protest document against the church and against Judaism, offering a new vision of Christianity based on secret revelation and on the soul returning to its origin in the kingdom of light. Our next text is the Gospel of Mary. And uh, as you can see, this is a pretty fragmentary uh, piece of Greek uh, manuscript. And uh, there are other manuscripts as well, but we only have half of the Gospel of Mary uh, surviving. It comes from roughly the same period as the Gospel of Thomas, uh, some say a bit later, and it's attributed the Mary in question is Mary Magdalene, although again, no scholar thinks that it's really by uh, Mary Magdalene. As in Thomas, the soul is trapped in the body, which the Gospel of Mary calls the fetter of oblivion, the chain uh, of oblivion. And probably the major theme of the Gospel of Mary, as far as we can tell from what's left of it, is that the soul has to get past hostile powers. It has to present the right kinds of passwords to the evil powers who are trying to prevent the soul from ascending back up to heaven. Now, two of these demonic interrogators who try and interrogate the soul uh, in what survives of the text are called desire and ignorance. And we can see a bit of that here. Desire said, I did not see you descending, but now I see you ascending. How can you lie since you belong to me? The soul answered and said, I saw you, but you did not see me, nor did you recognize me. I was merely a garment to you, and you did not know me. So when, it, when the soul had said these things, it went away rejoicing great, greatly. It, su it successfully passed that demon. So it gets on to the next one, the third power. It came to the third power called ignorance. And it, the third power, ignorance, questioned the soul, saying, where are you going in wickedness? You have been bound. You are bound indeed, judge not. And then the soul again answers successfully. Why do you judge me when I judge not? Now, this is not so much the influence of Greek philosophy, although one does find that elsewhere in the Gospel of Mary. This is more the influence of Mediterranean folk religion and perhaps especially uh, Egyptian religion, according to which way back in the Book of the Dead and even before that in the pyramid texts and coffin texts, one has to get past uh, particular guardians who are guarding the portals uh, to the afterlife. And that seems to be uh, influential on the Gospel of Mary here, the idea that one has to pass demonic interrogators in order for the soul to make its way back to God. The Gospel of Judas is the most recently known and only made uh, widely available to scholars in 2006. Now, like the Gospel of Thomas to some extent, the Gospel of Judas is also a protest gospel. It's bitterly hostile to the mainstream church, and in fact, it devotes almost as much uh, attention and space to criticism of other groups as it does to its positive present presentation of what it regards as the good news. Here's a sample of that protest from near the beginning of the book. One day in Judea, he, that's Jesus, came to the disciples and he found them sitting gathered, practicing their piety. When he met his disciples sitting gathered and giving thanks over the bread, uh, the word for giving thanks is Eucharist uh, here, giving thanks over the bread, he laughed. So immediately we're hit by a quite different picture of Jesus from the one we're used to. Here we have a laughing Jesus who mocks the traditional piety of the church. And in another contrast to the New Testament, uh, G Judas is transformed from the terrible betrayer of Jesus and is made into the trusted recipient of Jesus' revelation in this Gospel of Judas. Judas alone knows the good news. So what is this good news in the Gospel of Judas? Well, it centers on two things, understanding who Jesus is and understanding the world and the Gnostics' place in the world, the place in the world of the person who has true knowledge. So on the first point, Judas alone reveals who Jesus is. Judas said to him, I know who you are and from where you have come. You have come from the immortal eon of Barbalo, and the one who sent you is one whose name I'm not worthy to speak. So this is a kind of cross between the New Testament and Star Trek. Jesus comes from this... Uh, <laughs> astronomical plane called 
Barbalo, uh, and uh, this, this is actually a common idea in the second century as one of the uh, divine uh, places in, in the heavenly realms who's associated with a, with a female deity. But it's an idea fairly alien to the first century Judaism of Jesus' own culture. Conversely, the real Jesus is just a disembodied spirit. Near the end of the Gospel of Judas, Jesus says to him, Truly I say to you, Judas, you will be greater than them all, for you will sacrifice the man who carries me about. So Jesus isn't really a human being. There's merely a kind of human trolley which uh, transports the, spirit, the, the true spirit uh, around. So there's no sense here of uh, Jesus giving his life as a ransom for many or laying down his life for his friends. Instead, and this is the second component of the Gospel of Judas's good news, uh, the Gospel which Jesus reveals is an account of the structure of the heavenly realms, the various deities who inhabit the particular eons in the universe, people like uh, Barbalo, how a heavenly plan of the world existed in these heavenly realms, and uh, the material world which we inhabit is merely a substandard uh, bad copy of this heavenly model. And the reason this uh, material world down here is such a bad copy is because it's been made by an evil creator deity who's called Saklas, the Aramaic, related to the Aramaic word for stupid. So Saklas, uh, Saklas said to his angels, let us make man according to the likeness and according to the image. And they created Adam and his wife Eve, who in the cloud is called Zoe. So uh, creation by an evil deity there. So Jesus doesn't save by coming into the world and dying. In fact, one, one of the things which uh, really hit me when I was writing uh, my book on this strange gospel uh, was that there's, it suddenly occurred to me one afternoon, uh, that there's no mention of love in the whole book. There's no mention of the love of God, uh, no mention of the love of Jesus, no mention of disciples being expected to love in imitation of God. This is really rather a bitter gospel, criticizing the church and having very little positive to say. The fact that the church and the world are doomed according to the gospel of Judas are an essential part of this saving revelation. Our final example, the gospel of Philip. Now, this is actually one of the most uh, well-known in the public realms, uh, although uh, even if you don't, because even if you don't know this title of the Gospel of Philip, you might have heard uh, some of its content. And that is because this is often used in those conspiracy theory explanations of early Christianity, according to which Jesus has a, relation, a special relationship with Mary Magdalene. And I won't bore you by going into more and more Da Vinci Code uh, territory, which Da Vinci Code has it, had its sort of 15 seconds of fame. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that the, the manuscript evidence for this relationship of Jesus with Mary Magdalene is based on pretty flimsy grounds. And uh, this is actually the page where uh, that account supposedly appears. So let me try and give you a sense of what this manuscript actually says here about Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And uh, blank, companion of the blank, these are gaps in the manuscript, the blanks. Mary Magdalene, blank, used to blank, more than the disciples, blank, greet or kiss her, blank, times the rest, blank, blank. <laughs> so, uh, it's rather like those uh, FBI documents, you know, <laughs> with, uh, all, with, with all the juicy bits blanked out, you know. Uh, anyway, this Gospel of Philip is generally assumed to have been composed uh, by someone who was a member of the Valentinian group in the second century. The Valentinians, named after their founder, uh, Valentinus, who was one of the uh, leading opponents of the church in the second century. It wasn't really written by either of the New Testament Philips. This gospel, like uh, some of the others that I've mentioned already, uh, is especially interested in how the soul needs to recapture its fellowship uh, with Jesus, again being trapped inside this physical body. In the religious worldview of this book, salvation comes not so much by passing hostile demonic inter interrogators, but through a mystical baptism, which it calls chrism, or anointing, which seems to have been administered somehow by anointing with olive oil. That's how you re reach a state of perfection. 
Uh, and again, the world is bad because it's been created not so much by an evil deity, as in the Gospel of Judas, but by certainly an incompetent deity. The world came about through a mistake, for he who created it wanted to create it imperishable and immortal, and he fell short of attaining his desire. Now, this low opinion of the material world extends to the body as well. No one will hide a large, valuable object in something large, but many a time one has tossed countless thousands into a thing worth an asarion, a, 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 a tiny coin of low value. Compare the soul. It is a precious thing, and it came to be in a contemptible body. But according to the Gospel of Philip, as I say, the soul can be rescued uh, by both water baptism, which the Gospel of Philip shares with other Christians, but also this special uh, baptism for the elite, this spiritual baptism, this chrism. For this reason, it is fitting to baptize in both, in the light and the water. And now the light is the chrism. So you need to have both baptisms, but this mystical anointing, the light baptism, is superior. The chrism is superior to baptism, for it is from the word chrism that we have that we are called Christians. Certainly not because of the word baptism. People aren't named after uh, baptism. I mean, people don't go around calling themselves Baptists, uh, do they? Um, again, un unfortunately for the uh, sensationalists, it's highly unlikely that this gospel can tell us anything at all about the real historical Jesus. Scholars date the Gospel of Philip to the second or even the third century. So it comes from a time probably around one or even 200 years after the earthly ministry of Jesus. So the chances of it having preserved any authentic material are slim, or at least it would be very difficult for us to uh, identify what that is. And we know it comes from later than the four New Testament Gospels because by its own admission, it quotes from them. So here, first of all, a quote from Matthew or Luke, and then a quotation uh, from John's Gospel. So, of course, the Gospel of Philip then won't allow us, again, to get back behind the New Testament to another Jesus. It tells us a lot about the controversies that go, are going on after New Testament times, but doesn't really give us any new information about Jesus himself. So, what are we to make of all this? How do we compare the New Testament Gospels with these four others? Well, the first point which I've touched upon already is that the apocryphal Gospels are quite insecure textually. That is, the manuscript evidence for the, what they actually say is comparatively weak, uh, as we've seen uh, in the, uh, well, just to sketch out what we have for the New Testament, first of all, 124 papyri, 280 uncials, 2,808 minuscules, and so on. Uh, now, a lot of those manuscripts are very late, but the papyri and a lot of the uncials uh, come from an early period, and about half of those uh, cover the Gospels. By contrast with the Gospel of Thomas, we have three uh, fragments uh, in Greek and one, fairly, one full Coptic translation, with Mary two very fragmentary bits of uh, Greek and half of it in Coptic. Uh, in the Gospel of Judas' case, one Coptic translation from the original Greek, 80% complete, uh, and Philip uh, roughly the same. Again, so Gospel of Judas and Philip, nothing in the original uh, language. As a, as a result of this, what we can really know precisely about the contents of these apocryphal Gospels is much less secure than it is with the New Testament Gospels. Now, that doesn't tell us anything yet about whether they're trustworthy and reliable in what they say, but it does mean that what we can know in detail about them is much less secure. We don't have their original wording. So that's the first point. The second point is that there are, there's a crucial generation gap between the New Testament Gospels and the four canonical Gospels. And this is a crucial point, really. The, the apocryphal Gospels don't appear on the scene until decades after the New Testament Gospels. Now, as I've mentioned at the beginning, the New Testament Gospels were written roughly between about AD 60 and AD 90. And there's a big difference between this generation, AD 60 to AD 90, and the later generation from around AD 130, 140 and following, uh, during the, which is the time when these other Gospels start to be written. The reason for this is that after about AD 90, almost all the people who had ever known Jesus in his earthly ministry were dead. 
by about 100, there was probably no one, AD of 100, there was probably no one left who had known Jesus, who had a direct connection with him in the events of his earthly ministry. So by the time these apocryphal gospels are written, there are no living eyewitnesses left alive. Now, one analogy which I find helpful to use here is that the distance in time between Jesus and the last of the New Testament Gospels, the Gospel of John, of course it's much closer with the other uh, three, Matthew, Mark and Luke, the distance between Jesus and the last of the New Testament Gospels is about 60 years, as I mentioned, about the distance between us and the Second World War. Now, probably all of us have a surprising amount of uh, acquaintances who can tell us about the Second World War. My granny is still alive and she can tell me about driving trucks in the Second World War. We have a, a couple in our church who were, got engaged in 1940 and uh, are still going strong today. Uh, there are lots of people still alive who can testify to the events of the Second World War. But the situation is very difficult, different with the First World War. Does anyone, know, anyone here know anyone who was a combatant in the First World War? I don't think so. Uh, according to the uh, newspapers, the last surviving combatant in the First World War died uh, earlier this year. And the reason for this analogy is that the distance between us and World War I is about the same distance between the apocryphal gospel writers and the earthly Jesus. So uh, there's about that, that hundred-year gap between us and the First World War, just as there's about a hundred-year gap between the earthly Jesus and his ministry and the beginnings of these gospel writers uh, outside of the canon. So with the gospels like Mary, Thomas, Philip, and Judas in the second century, we've entered a new time frame which is disconnected from the people who knew Jesus firsthand. But in the time, by contrast, when the New Testament gospels are written, there are still these eyewitnesses alive. Thirdly, we can look at some cultural factors. I think there are very good reasons to see the portraits of Jesus in the New Testament as the ones which really reflect the earthy culture of first century Judaism. And uh, that, of course, follows on from the fact that it's reported by eyewitnesses, uh, not from second century Gentiles uh, outside of the Jewish environment. So we can make some comparisons between the four New Testament Gospels and the others that I've talked about. We can talk about how they uh, refer to places. So, for example, the Gospel of Mary, uh, although, of course, we don't have much of it, the Gospel of Mary doesn't refer to any uh, places in the land of Israel at all, any uh, places in Judea. Uh, the two places mentioned in the Gospels of Thomas and Judas are the world and Judea. Uh, which doesn't exactly give you much detail. In the Gospel of Philip, it's the world and Jerusalem. By contrast, in the New Testament Gospels, uh, we have a whole host, and this is just a small selection uh, on the screen, uh, we have a whole host of different places uh, referred to, concrete locations which Jesus moves around uh, in. Or we can refer to uh, the personal names in the New Testament Gospels by contrast with the other Gospels. In the New Testament, uh, they fit with what we know about the detailed work that has been done on uh, names uh, from that period, uh, Jewish names. So, uh, uh, and what we notice when we look at the other Gospels is that either these names have just been drawn from the New Testament, or when new names are introduced, they, they seem a bit funny. So Thomas includes just the names that we know of already in the New Testament, but when we get to the Gospel of Judas, we get all these funny extra names, uh, these names of deities like Barbalo, Sophia, Satklas, Nimrod, Yaldabaoth, Orth, Autogenes, Harmathoth, Galila, Yobel, and Adonaios, uh, and uh, Sophia in the Gospel of Philip. So when we look at these names, they're either derivative from the New Testament or they're alien. And we find the same thing again with uh, coins. The first case is one of uh, the Gospel of Philip, where we get reference to an Asarion, like we do in the, in the Gospels, uh, and in the same way of, as we find it in the Gospels as well, uh, as, a symbol, as a coin of very little value. Are not two sparrows sold for an Asarion? Uh, this, uh, a, 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 an Asarion here is uh, something worthless. Uh, 
But uh, the only other instance of a coin mentioned in the uh, apocryphal gospels that I've mentioned comes in the Gospel of Thomas. And this is in the scene where they discuss whether to pay taxes to Caesar. And of course, you remember from the scene in the New Testament gospels, what coin is it that's talked about here? It's a denarius. By contrast, in the Gospel of Thomas, they showed Jesus a gold coin and said to him, Caesar's men demand taxes from us. So uh, someone brings Jesus a, uh, a gold coin, and what's called an aureus. Now the difficulty with this is that you can imagine someone carrying around a denarius, maybe a couple of denarii, a day's wage for a laborer. On the other hand, an aureus is about a month's wage. And so it's very difficult to imagine this as kind of fitting in the historical circumstances with someone just carrying around uh, a month's wages casually and, showing, and waving it around uh, and showing it to, showing it to Jesus. Uh, much less realistic, I think. So these instances of uh, personal names, place names, and coins, I think, are just, are just three brief examples. What, they, what I think they point to is the fact that when we read the New Testament Gospels, we see a Jesus who's really rooted in time and space, who's anchored in the Jewish world in which he grew up, going from specific place to specific place, going from festival to festival, and so on, eventually going to his death at Golgotha, just outside Jerusalem. Fourthly and briefly, just some uh, theological or religious factors. We've seen that Jesus is connected, from, uh, disconnect, is connected to uh, Judaism culturally uh, in the New Testament Gospels and disconnected culturally in these other Gospels. And in fact, in these other Gospels, uh, the Jesus who's described there is quite anti-Jewish. So uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus condemns the prophets as dead and even describes in the Gospel of Judas the creator God of the Old Testament as an evil deity. And this again, I, I think, suggests that these other Gospels come out of an environment uh, which is Gentile, which is disconnected from Judaism, and which is detached in time as well from the Christianity of the apostles. On the other hand, uh, the New Testament Gospels, as we've seen, insist again and again that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. And I would suggest it gives us a much more satisfying picture of uh, who Jesus is. In the New Testament Gospels, we have a real incarnation. Sorry, I'm just catching up a bit here. <laughs> uh, we have a real incarnation where Jesus is a real human being, not just a spiritual being uh, carried about by some uh, physical entity, as we saw in the Gospel of Judas. And related to this, again, the point that Jesus in the New Testament uh, reveals a God of love. Salvation comes from God's initiative in his loving, redemptive plan, by contrast to mysterious revelation, mysterious knowledge. And every one of the New Testament Gospels emphasizes this point, the love of God, the love of Christ in giving himself, and the love which is then expected of the disciples, not secret knowledge and secret revelation. Nearly finally we get re specific reminders in the New Testament Gospels that they incorporate eyewitness testimony. When the New Testament authors are writing their Gospels, they show that they had direct access themselves or by talking to other eyewitnesses about the events of Jesus. So John, for example, uh, says this in his Gospel, the man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. Same we find in Luke, or similar. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Luke says this, as you can see from the fact that it's one, one to two, Luke says this right at the beginning of his gospel, but it's not until much later, actually, into the book of Acts and near the, the end of the book of Acts that we see who some of these eyewitnesses were, some of these people who Luke bumped into on his missionary journey with Paul. And uh, here's just a sample of some of the people who Luke met. You may remember, if you've read the book of Acts, 
that halfway through, uh, after he did this and he did this and he did this and he did this, suddenly starts, we did this and we went to such and such a place and we met such and such a bunch of people. And so Luke met Lydia, Sopater, Secundus, Gaius, Timothy, Tychicus and Trophimus, Aristarchus, Eutychus, the guy who fell out the window, and Julius, uh, Philip the Evangelist, in one of the early uh, followers, Agabus, Mnason, who's called an ancient disciple, that's perhaps a follower of uh, Jesus, the brothers in Jerusalem, and James and all the Jerusalem elders. Luke bumped into all these people and had a chance to talk to them about, who, uh, about the events of Jesus' ministry as far as they knew it. Uh, similarly, we can see in Mark's Gospel, uh, we have this strange, uh, perhaps seemingly arbitrary mention of the children of Simon and Cy Simon of Cyrene, Alexander and Rufus. Why are these guys mentioned here? There seems to be no, they don't play any role in the uh, narrative of Mark's Gospel. Well, I think the best explanation is that they're mentioned because they're known to Mark's audience. They're known to some of the Christians in the early church presumably as people who passed on this story about Simon of Cyrene, their father. And similarly, Mark makes reference to uh, some of the women who were witnesses, eyewitnesses to the crucifixion. Some women were watching from a distance uh, Jesus crucified. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph, and Salome. So Mark uh, names the women who watched the crucifixion and so who were in a position to pass on uh, some of the details. This is why it makes a difference that the other Gospels, like the Gospels of Thomas, Judas, Philip, and uh, Mary, were written after the deaths of these eyewitnesses. They're written in a period, as I say, from around 130 onwards, uh, when there were so, certainly no uh, eyewitnesses alive to give addi additional information about Jesus that they'd known. But also in this period, the eyewitnesses have gone, and so they're not there to restrain the production of new stories about Jesus. And so there's greater liberty for these apocryphal gospel writers to produce all sorts of other stuff. But the New Testament gospel writers are in touch with and incorporate eyewitness testimony. To conclude then, we've seen that the focus of the New Testament gospels is on Jesus as fulfilling Old Testament scripture, and secondly, on his death and resurrection as the central events in those gospels. As Paul said to the Corinthians, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day, according to the scriptures. The apocryphal gospels, on the other hand, have very different centers of gravity. They're generally ne negative about the Old Testament, and even negative about the Old Testament God, the creator God. And again, salvation is very different as well. The problem is not one of sin, but instead one of ignorance and being trapped in the material body, so that one needs to ascend to the kingdom of light, having, ascent, having escaped this material world. So I hope it's clear that there are important differences between the four New Testament Gospels and these four other Gospels. Not just differences in their content, in what they say, but also differences in the circumstances of their composition, the circumstances in which they were produced. We've got a big difference between the New Testament Gospels, were written, which were written in the first century, between about 60 and 90, by people in touch with first century Judaism. And then we have these others written in the second century by Gentiles out of touch with the culture in which Jesus conducted his ministry. It's not just that the other Gospels are weird. Some of the things in the New Testament Gospels are pretty strange uh, as well. But in the New Testament Gospels, it's a first century Jewish strangeness, a strangeness actually ac accurately reported by the eyewitnesses, not so that it would fit with our comfortable modern expectations, but so that we could see Jesus as he really is. Thank you very much for listening. I give you in response, Dr. David Chet. There is one word that especially comes to mind when I, when I hear uh, Simon's presentation here, and that is uh, the word brilliant. Uh, this is an absolutely brilliant presentation, and I mean that, Simon, in both the British and the American sense of the word. Um, and, and what you need to know, uh, for, again, is that 
the gentleman that you just had present, Dr. Gattacol, has, has not only given you a nice overview and summary and spoken at a level that we can all, I think, understand, but he is also building on years of experience of detailed work in these Gospels. You may have noticed that um, when, when Mark at the very beginning showed you some of the books that Simon has written, uh, that one of them is on the Gospel of Judas, which he described in some detail. And it's, it is the best entry point, I think, into the Gospel of Judas. Uh, he presents the text, he translates it, he gives you a commentary on passage by passage all the way through. So if you want to get a sense for, your, for yourself what one of these uh, non-canonical apocryphal gospels feels like, then, then that is a great entry point into that. And then his, his work on Thomas, the monograph that's out, and the commentary that's coming. You, you have somebody who has a great deal of experience, and what he was doing was sharing to you in an approachable way kind of the, the, the results of years of careful study. So bear that in mind as you, as you see this, this brilliant presentation and a very helpful summary. There's so many features that I appreciated as I was uh, listening to the lecture. Um, you know, one of the things that he does is he does a great job of pointing out the late date of these Gospels. I love that illustration, don't you, of World War I and World War II and, and how, how distant some of these Gospels are from the actual events. Um, I also like um, the, the way that he shows to us that they don't really have the ring of historical plausibility. Uh, with the names and the issue of the coins, as well as just the way that they don't feel at all like second century or first century Judaism. They feel like second century Gnosticism. Um, I think one of the things that Simon very wisely does in this presentation as well is to give us a sense of the contents of the gospel. Many of these, these gospels, um, many times when I've heard presentations on it, there's some excellent discussion of uh, the dates of the Gospels and, and the, the difference in dates. But I think one of the things that most helps us with it is, is when you give a people a sense of the contents of the Gospels, the allure of the Gospels is quickly diminished. I, I mean, by giving us a sense of the flavor of the Gospels, you, you have a sense uh, just how strange these are, theologically, historically strange. And of course, his five evaluation points there um, very careful and, and accurate critique. Um, one of the things that I, I like to say to my students is that as a New Testament scholar, um, Dr. Gattacol and myself and all in our field, kind of, we, we walk two lines. We're, we're historians as well as theologians. And, and you got a sense of, of, of Simon's theological heart, but you also have a very careful historical critique of what actually could go back to the time of Jesus. With these Gospels, there's something extremely helpful to them, of, of, or from them, to somebody in my position, in that they give us a great historical sense of second century Gnosticism. And that's, that's extremely useful. It is only if you then try and make a claim as to the historical Jesus that it becomes extremely problematic, as, as Simon has aptly said. Um, the one thing that I know Simon didn't have time for, he and I had a chance to discuss this beforehand, he simply didn't have time in the presentation to add to the presentation, um, and I mean, you know, there just physically wasn't time in, in the allotted time, to talk about the, the early church fathers and their testimony to the four canonical gospels and also their awareness of these non-canonical gospels. Many of these non-canonical gospels are actually discussed by church fathers in the second and third century. They know these gospels. These, these are not a surprise. If you and I were living in the second century and we were walking with people like Irenaeus and, and great scholars like that from that time, they had known, they, they knew the contents of these gospels and they were not surprised. They also knew how distant they were from the canonical gospels. Um, aside from that, those same scholars from that period, the second century, they also knew the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels you and I know. And they frequently referred to them as the four. It was a collective whole. And that you see this at the end of the second century with somebody like Irenaeus. You see it with somebody like Tatian, who's going to pre present a harmony of the Gospels, but it's going to be called the Dia Tesseron, 
through the four Gospels. He takes the four Gospels because he knows those to be authentic in order to present his harmony in a single narrative. You see this with the Muratorian canon from roughly the same time that lists the four canonical Gospels as canon, and, and the other Gospels it explicitly excludes. You, you see this with even earlier as you move into the, the middle part of the second century with somebody like Justin in terms of the Gospels that he used. If you move into the beginning of the, of the second century, now we're just, we're, we're back to that time period that's, um, that, that's much like uh, almost World War I for us. Um, these authors from that time, like Papias, know that there are four canonical Gospels that are read in the churches and that are accepted. So, so that's very important ancillary testimony to the kinds of things that uh, Dr. Gattercole was presenting. Uh, now, uh, one of the things I, I did want to turn to just for a second, and, and uh, uh, Simon gave us, again, that wonderful illustration of World War I and World War II, right, with the idea that we are um, about as far away from World War II as the, the latest gospel in the New Testament was from the time of Jesus. We are about as far away from World War I, and this is, this is where I, I would uh, tweak what he said just slightly, as the earliest of the, uh, of the four Gospels they, did, they talked about uh, was away from Jesus. So the Gospel of Thomas is the earliest of the four Gospels he discussed. If, if we were to look at the other three Gospels, Judas, um, Philip, as well as um, uh, Thank you very much. That's right, exactly. Um, so it, 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 as the Gospel of Mary, those Gospels are actually about as time distant as we are from the Civil War. So think in those terms, okay? And that, as I was thinking about that just in the last couple of days, I, I came up with another analogy, which is uh, you, you may know that this summer that there was a, a, a great study of the Civil War period that also was a blockbuster movie. I'm, I'm of course, referring to... Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. <laughs> now, I have not actually seen Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. It just occurred to me in the last couple of days to think about that. Um, and so, as being, a, being a scholar, I knew exactly what to do. I poured myself a cup of coffee, and I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> and I read about Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. What's it called? And, and, um, and, and what, of course, what Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter says is that basically almost every event in, in, Abraham, in Abraham Lincoln's life was actually the result of vampires, the death of his mother and many other events in his life, and that he fought vampires all the way through his, uh, his early days and into his presidency. Now, okay, remember that we're about that far out. And, and now somebody can create a narrative that is like that. And yet we're still in a position to be able to say, like Irenaeus was with the canonical gospels, uh, that's just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't have any air of historical plausibility there. Now, I, I want to carry it a little bit further, that analogy, because I, I haven't yet kicked it around until it's completely dead. Um, <laughs> And so imagine with me, if, if you were to think of, again, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, but you were also to think of somebody, let's, let's say Mark was, in addition to having constructed, on, uh, designed, and, and built on his own at this beautiful library here, among many other things, he, he has another talent that you haven't heard about, which is that he's been working on a time machine in his basement. And, and, and he dials that time machine to about 1,850 years later which is about how far we are from these non-canonical Gospels, Mary, Philip, etc. And, and he was to, to project himself into the future and, and to land back here in Houston. Houston at this time has, the suburbs have grown to encompass all of uh, southern Texas, um, 1850 years in the future. The library is still standing and um, they've almost been able to fill up after a uh, thousand years of, of careful acquisition all the shelf space that Mark has already created. And, and, and he was to go around, and he was to find that there are um, scholars in the day that are, have been studying meticulously Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. And, and some who have even been willing to leave the impression 
that we should take it quite seriously as a historical document, not just as a testimony to the, uh, the little cabal that created it, but it's something even broader. And, and that it actually represented the diversity of opinions about Abraham, in, uh, in, in uh, Abraham Lincoln that is, in uh, 21st century America. I think he would be a little bit disconcerted by that. If, if he were to read a work of fiction, let's call it the, um, I don't know, the Abraham Code, uh, 1850 years in the future, and it was to say uh, something like uh, the Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter novel and movie actually is better history than any other previous historical work on Abraham Lincoln. I think the word he would use, and I, I recognize that this is a very non-scholarly word, but is that this is ludicrous. And I, I am gonna say, I, I'm normally a very staid scholarly guy, and that is not a word that I use lightly. But let's return for just a half a second to these canonical gospels. Again, they give us great historical testimony to second century Gnosticism, and they're incredibly useful there. But if you are thinking of them in terms of historical plausibility to, to give us an accurate picture of who Jesus was, um, the word ludicrous simply has to come to mind. It is um, ludicrous to think that Jesus descended from the eons of Barbalo. It is, it is ludicrous to think that Jesus walked on this earth and taught others that their bodies didn't matter and that they were spiritually to ascend. It is ludicrous to think that he held that the Father that created the world that is around us was an evil God. It is, it is ludicrous to think that uh, he turned to Judas and, and praised him from releasing him from his earthly tent. That is, that is ludicrous in terms of actual history. And, and I think it's important for us to be able to see that, say that. What is not ludicrous, speaking as a historian of the New Testament era and also as a theologian, is it is not ludicrous to say, along with the four canonical gospels, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that he walked and ministered in northern Galilee, that he taught of the kingdom of heaven, that he performed miraculous acts that other people perceived and, and they were amazed by. It's not ludicrous, and I, I'm working here with um, a very careful historical evaluation that's not just based on the four canonical gospels, but it is, that it is not ludicrous. In fact, it is right and good historically to say that Jesus faced a cross. It is, it is right historically to say that prior to that cross, he anticipated his death and he taught that it would be a ransom for sins. It is, it is not ludicrous to say that he instituted the Lord's Supper as a commemoration of his death that was the establishment of a covenant and that his blood was the blood of a covenant that provides for forgiveness of sins. It is not ludicrous to say, historically even, that those, and I, here I go back to Peter Williams' presentation just, just recently, which is online. It is not ludicrous to say, historically, that the disciples of Jesus so believed that he was risen from the dead, that the tomb was empty, and that they had witnessed him personally, even touched him, that they were willing to die for that. That is not ludicrous. And so it, it's important to, to, to evaluate this on that level. Now, I, I should say at this stage that as you're filling out your cards um, to ask questions of Simon, it's important to distinguish the response from, this, from the, the lecture. And so Simon took the high road and spoke of World War II and World War I. It was I that mentioned Abraham Lincoln. Being <laughs> so be careful about that. But I do want to thank you all very much for, for this and Mark for providing this. I have only two brief things to say. Uh, uh, both of these gentlemen are very generous in the way they do the dates. They did dates taking the latest written gospel and going backwards, and they did dates taking the earliest apocryphal gospel and going backwards. I'm a lawyer. I'm not so generous. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark was written at a time where, from today, the President of the United States was either, depending on where you want to date it, Bill Clinton or Ron Reagan. That's how close the writing the Gospel of Mark was to the events of Jesus and 
and his death. Now, I suspect a good many of you remember Bill Clinton and Ron Reagan, uh, and probably voted for one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the Gospel of Judas, which the, was it the National Enquirer or the Mail said had changed, the, would, <laughs> would destroy the church. If we go back in time, do you know who the President of the United States was when the Gospel of Judas was written, if it were written today? Well, we didn't have a president. It would have been 1742. We didn't even have a Boston Tea Party yet. So that's the difference in dating between the time that those Gospels were written versus the time of the events. My second comment. Uh, these guys are scholars, and as such, they have terms that they throw around that a lot of people may not uh, readily understand. At least, I've got two daughters in here, one who is almost 15, and one who is 13, and I suspect they don't understand what the Gnostics were, and so, uh, and the way this affected, uh, or the way these apocryphal Gospels illuminate us about second century Gnosticism. So I wanna take just a moment, and part of my response to make sure we understand this, you know, the church initially is a, is a, a, a sect of Judaism. The initial wave of the church are Jews. Paul takes, well, first Peter with Cornelius, but, but Paul principally goes out into the Mediterranean world and he takes the gospel message not simply to Jews but to also Gentiles. Most of the Gentiles he goes to are Gentiles that are attending synagogue. So they're Gentiles that are at least tied into Judaism. Not all of them. He preaches on Mars Hill. But you've got that principally. Over time, however, throughout the world, history shows us that lesser and lesser of the intelligentsia within the church came out of Judaism, and more and more came out of the Greek world and Greek thought. Several hundred years, 300 plus before Christ, there was a Greek philosopher named Plato who was one of the principal proponents of the idea that the soul is, is a, 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 a pre-existent and eternal part of a, an essence of a human and that right now it's chained within a body. And the idea of a soul being severed from the body was a very platonic idea that took hold and, and grew and permeated a lot of Greek philosophical thought. So in the first century, and even more so in the second century, the church was influenced as the Greek intelligentsia were entering into the church. They took these ideas of the soul and they would take New Testament Gospels and other things which talked about soul or talked about life, and they infused into a kind of a, a, a mishmash, a mashup of Christian doctrine, sort of, Christian words with this idea of, of, uh, uh, of a almost platonic dualism in man. And, and from this grew up a whole religious movement that's called Gnostics from the Greek word for knowledge because the idea was you could have secret knowledge that would help you understand these secrets and and these are not secrets that are based upon the idea of of man as a, a an entire being made by God they're based upon the idea that you've got this soul imprisoned in the body. And so they affected views of Christ. Some people thought that Jesus was just some soul that descended perhaps at the baptism onto this, or that Christ was a soul that descended at baptism onto this body of this fellow named Jesus. And in fact, one famous Gnostic taught that right toward the end, not wanting to endure the crucifixion, Christ left Jesus, let Jesus die, and he, Christ watched it from another hillside. Because, you know, and, and there are different views of how this came down, lots of different views. Those are the Gnostic views.
that we see reflected in these Gospels to some degree or another. And that's the sense that David and Simon, I think, would agree would uh, uh, these Gospels help teach us more about what the Gnostics thought. So with that, I'll, I'll do some questions. And Simon, would you take your place up at the podium? Sure. All right, so these are rapid fire. Okay. Okay, this is the bonus round. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> 60. Why do they call these books Gospels when they are anti-Christian? They, they call themselves Gospels, I suppose, because by that time, the Gospel was, on the, on the one hand, a type of book, a, a type of book which records the teaching of Jesus, and a type of book which records the teaching of Jesus which, by which you get salvation. And so that's why these Gospels call themselves All right, gospels. rapid question answer. What are the strongest arguments against some recent New Testament studies which attempt to place Thomas in the first century? The idea that he has pithy statements that are more likely early than late, etc. Well, I think p pithy statements are no, no more likely to be early or late. And some people have argued that some of the, some of the versions are earlier because, thing, because things start short and get longer. Uh, but also things can start long and get shorter. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that, to me, the fact that Thomas talks about uh, Jesus criticizing circumcision, uh, Jesus, quote, Jesus quoting Paul's letters, I think, you know, those are some of the reasons why I would say it's... And along that line, uh, um, if the Gospel of Thomas is a book of sayings, could the saying, uh, the Logia, about blessed is the man who came into being before he came into being, actually be Jesus talking about himself? That's very interesting. That's how Cyprian understood it. That's how Cyprian understood it? Cyprian understood it. Uh, Jesus didn't really sort of talk about himself as blessed. I don't, it would be a very unusual... I mean, he very commonly uses... Blessed is he who, to describe the disciple. I can't think, and there are lots and lots of examples of those. It would be unparalleled, I think, for him to say, blessed is he who, in reference to himself. Why would any legitimate scholar give these gospels serious consideration? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, I think there are a number of impulses to, to, to that. I think uh, partly there's a desire to, there's always a great interest in new discoveries not only by the Mail on Sunday or by Dan Brown, but also among scholars. And, 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 and scholars who work on, work on a particular document often exaggerate the importance of that particular document because that's, you know, how they've made their career um, sometimes. And, and, and um, there's, a, there's, a, there's often a desire to say something new, you know, to get a grant from the NEH or whatever it is. <laughs> you, you, you can't get a grant from the NEH NH by saying, I want to argue that the the New Testament Gospels show that Jesus died for our sins. You know, you, 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 but you can get a grant by saying that the Apocryphon of James gives us vital information that helps us understand the Jesus tradition. Given life expectancy differences between then and now, what's the likeliness someone was alive by the Gospels who was a witness to Jesus? Well, I think, I think if you, um, at, at the time when John's Gospel is written, around AD 90, uh, um, you would have to be I guess, 80, 85, 90 to be, uh, to be alive to do that. And there were people, there were plenty of people who, who lived that long. And uh, I mean, not as many as today, but, you know, the Greek playwright Sophocles lived, to, lived, to, lived, lived into his 80s. Polycarp, the early church, lived into his 80s. And the second century tradition about John's Gospel is that it was written by a very old man in his, in, you know, in his 80s at the, at the end of his life. Within, the old, or within church history, among the Reformers, some suggested that the Old Testament Apocrypha could be read with profit, even if they were not canonical scripture. Do you think the same could be said of these Gospels you've discussed tonight? No. Are these Gospels... <laughs> this is rapid fire. Are these Gospels ever called by other names, i.e. Gospels, since it gives the impression of equality with true Gospels? Are they ever called other things by... Well, let, let me ask it this way, because you've kind of answered that before uh, in the Q&A. Do the New Testament Gospels call themselves Gospels? Well, um, Mark's Gospel begins with the, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark's Gospel sort of sets itself out as, as, uh, as the Gospel. 
What about Matthew, Luke, and John? Well, they're following in Mark, on Mark's model. So although they don't call themselves Gospels, they're sort of carrying on in that tradition. Have any fragments of writings in the period between New Testament writings and the Gnostics, say between 90 and 140, that could relate to Jesus been found? Not really. Oh, come on. Well, I mean, you've got the Didache. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, fragments in that sense. Yeah. I mean, works have, works have survived from, from that period. Yeah. One Clement, I suppose, is one major one. Yeah. The Didache, one Clement dating from around 96, 98. The Didache, early second century. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah there are some. okay. So people can go find stuff in that interim period that's actually produced by the church, if you yeah, will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you, if, you go, if you Google or put on Amazon Apostolic Fathers, then you'll oh, find, this is a good question. find okay. a volume of. But Sorry, I'm interrupting. We've got to keep moving. Uh, why do you think these Gospels were written? Were they an attempt to counteract, damage the spread of Christianity, an attempt to pick out good aspects of Christianity and incorporate them into regional folk religions? Were they con men looking to make a buck? What was going on? Well, I think when it, whenever you, often today we can find kind of forms of Christianity which look strange to us, and it's, it's because a fundamental point of Christian doctrine has been adapted too, too, too much to, to, to fit the particular culture that they're in, and I think that's what happened with the apocryphal gospel. Do all the uh, apocryphal gospels deserve to be labeled Gnostic? No, I mean, I, there, there are different ways in which scholars use the term Gnostic, and, um, and, and Mark and David have used it in a sort of broad sense of, of world-denying and um, and ascetical, perhaps. Um, I sort of take a, a, a narrower view that, uh, that Gnostic refers to a view where the creator God is not only uh, weak, like in the Gospel of Philip, but actually evil. And I think that's the way in which the church fathers, both the church fathers actually and Platonist philosophers from the early centuries talk about the Gnostics. So Plotinus, the uh, Greek philosopher of the third century AD, uh, writes a book against the Gnostics, and he, he, start, he, he, he calls it against, well, someone else calls it, one of his pupils calls it against the Gnostics. What he called it was against those who see the world and the, the, person, the, the God who made the world as evil. Uh, so that's, that's a kind of nice summary statement, I think, of Gnosticism. Thank you. God bless you.